Would you bow your heads even as we pray? Loving Lord, we are thankful for your faithfulness. Your faithfulness is the platform on which we should grow, O oh God, on which we should come before you daily, on which we should live so that those who dwell among us might recognize that we are indeed a peculiar people. We are, O oh God, your children. So we pray tonight uh, that you can touch your children in a special way. Anoint them, O oh God, and help them even as we go to your word that we can be drawn uh, closer to you. That we can learn what it means truly to be uh, Seventh-day Adventist. What it means to be in a relationship with you. Hide me again behind your cross. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As a principle, I would like to say this every time I stand before you. Every evening, we will go to the Bible. For in the Bible, we find truth. In the Bible, we find life. In the Bible, we come face to face with that man, Christ Jesus. You see, we need to go to the Bible because when we go to the Bible, we are encouraged. When we go to the Bible, we are guided as to how we can live in these tough, hard times. So the topic for this evening is Revelation's Greatest End Time Signs. Revelation's Greatest End Time Signs. Now, what sign are you seeing? Uh, when we talk about end time signs, I remember growing up and attending the Pathfinder Club and the Master Guide Club, and they would say, let's go camping because we are preparing for the end times. Uh, we are preparing for the end times. But what use is there preparing for the end times if you don't know what sign to look for? Seventh-day Adventists, we... Somehow we've forgotten from whence we came. And forgetting from whence we came, we have no idea where we headed. One of the questions I love to ask my congregations back home is, how many doctrines do we have, do we believe as a church? Now, you don't have to answer this lest you get into trouble uh, because a lot of folk, they would give a whole lot of wrong answers. Because we seem to major in coming to church and minor in learning about God. And I want you to understand, um, I'm going to give a prize to the person who can answer me before the end of this week. So uh, that is uh, a little homework for you, um, by the way. So long ago, on yesterday evening... We spoke about this just a little. I shared with you that Jesus sat on a hillside. And his disciples came to him and they asked, What shall be the sign of your coming? And Jesus, perhaps looking through the lens of time, saw what will happen, and so he started to prophesy. So he started to speak about what will happen in the end times. We read as Jesus was talking to his disciples, he says, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? And of the end of the world. Jesus decided to outline signs to them which would precede his second coming. I don't know about you, but I'm excited for Jesus to come. In addition, these signs would precede also the destruction of Jerusalem in the first century. That's what they believe. In 70 AD, Titus, the Roman general, attacked, overthrew, and totally devastated the city of Jerusalem. Jesus used 
the Roman destruction of Jerusalem by fire as a symbol of the destruction of the world by fire. The events which led up to the destruction of Jerusalem would be present at the end time on a much larger and grander magnificent scale. Here is something amazing. When we compare Jesus' prediction in Matthew chapter 24 with the predictions in the book of Revelation, they provide an incredible, accurate picture of our day. He was speaking about events of our times. Signs in the world of religion. I don't know if you know, but there are over 1,000 religions in the world. Every day it seems as if another one pops up with someone calling themselves a God or somebody worshiping something that they believe is a God. I'm staying on Oxbridge Road. So I decided to take a stroll, you know, just to take in some of the sunshine that apparently I brought. <laughs> and as I was heading away from the city center, where, well, it's not really a city, but the little um, center there in Ealing, heading towards where probably you have more housing and stuff, I passed by church. Well, several churches, but this one piqued my attention. I decided to look to see what type of church it was. It was a spiritual church. And I said to myself, they have these here too? So that caused me to do research, and I realized that uh, there are hundreds of churches in London. What shocked me was a church of the atheists. And I said to myself, these people don't believe in God, but yet still they congregate. Why are they congregating? There is something about man that draws us to learn about God or uh, things about God. Sign in the world of politics. Now, I've concluded that if Donald Trump can be president, anybody can be president. I hear him talking about squashing the Iran uh, nuclear, excuse me, <coughs> the Iran nuclear deal now. The Home Secretary for London, he is making his way just to try to tell him, no, don't do that. We see signs in the world of nature. Nature seemed to be rebelling. When it used to be, at least in the Caribbean, dry season, where you would have just sun and uh, the bush, the mountains would catch fire, it is raining all the time. When you don't expect a storm, uh, in fact, I remember in 2013, uh, hurricane season had just ended and we were preparing uh, for Christmas. And as we were preparing, it was Christmas Eve when a storm came in. Thirteen persons lost their lives. Nature is rebelling. We see signs in the world of a social life and we're talking about the LBGTQ. Looking at the telly and I noticed that there was a, a show that is trying to bring all of them together. Put them in a house and see how they would relate with each other. Not just there in the social life, but we can see also that marriages seem not to be on the foundation that God would have created it to be. Men are going back to the times when they believe it's okay to have several wives. And the women are saying, don't leave us because we can have several husbands too. So today, these signs are being played out in the headlines. 
splashed across our daily newspapers. Let's see if we can learn a little bit more about what Jesus was saying. He says in verse 5, for many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ. And shall deceive many. I read of a man in Mexico. He calls himself Jesus. He says that he is the embodiment of the second coming of Jesus. And I would believe that a man like that would just not be taken serious. But the man has thousands of followers around the world. And you would believe that he was the only one saying that he is the Christ. But if you Google it, you would see that there are dozens of people claiming to be Christ. Some claim that they were born Christ. Others are saying that the spirit of Christ entered them. This is the world that we live in. And I want you to understand a lot of part of the text says, and shall deceive many. And that's why we will start every night by saying that we go to the Bible. Because in the Bible we find truth, uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, the seven-day Adventist church uh, in its beginning from 1844 onward to 1860, it was established on biblical principles. And if we want to know about the signs of Jesus' coming, if we want to know about how we should live, we must go to the Bible. Many will come saying that they are Christ and they will deceive many. He said that in the end time, Jesus, that is, that the trauma and uncertainty will cause many to search for meaning. And instead of going to his word, they will turn to man and then they would find themselves involved in cults. Following people who want nothing but their money, their land, or their bodies. Reminds me, remember I'm from Guyana. One of the most renowned cult leaders was this fella called Jim Jones, who went to and he got on Guyana, you know, it's very big. We don't use, you know, 90% of the land available to us. So he applied to the government and they gave him a piece of land and he named it Jones Tongue, and he got a lot of people to leave North America, and they went there and they settled. They started to build houses and, and a whole lot of things, but he was leading them astray. He made them believe that he was Christ and that he would take them to the new Jerusalem. When families in North America realized what was going on and they, they started to uh, complain to the CIA and they started to do investigations and he realized that they were coming for him, he mixed a big barrel of Kool-Aid, poured poison in that, called them and I'm telling you, oh friends, when we see that word and shall deceive many, uh, they believed him so much that uh, they trusted him. They drank themselves to death. Many today claim to be prophets. These false cries will deliver messages that they say is from above. And they will recruit many. You want to know if a man is really a man of God? That man must preach Bible. You want to know if a man is really a man of God? That man must live in according to the word. The Bible declares and by their fruits you shall know them. If you ever see me uh, uh, coming to you and I'm preaching and I'm saying, oh, I need you to give me your money so that we can build a bigger church. Or, or I'm telling you that, you know, I need a jet or I need a car or I need something fancy. You know that my mind is not on Christ, but my mind is on things of the world. Bible says in Revelation 21 and verse 4, and God 
shall wipe away all these from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. But it continues in verse 5, it says, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I will make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. The Bible is true. The Bible is faithful. And God wants us to understand that if we are intended on getting to heaven, we must understand how to get there. We must know that there are signs and these signs are revealing themselves before us. And Oh, friends, brothers and sisters, it makes no sense that you come to this building, that you sit down, that you listen to other people like me who claim to preach the word, but then you leave this building and it goes to nothing. The psalmist wrote some beautiful words. The psalmist says that the flower fades, the grass withers. He didn't stop there. He continued by saying, but the word of God will stand forever. Someone must understand that if uh, you build your relationship with God uh, on Bible and, and not on waiting uh, to see a certain elder or a certain pastor or a certain member, you build that relationship with God uh, no matter what man might do because uh, men will fail you, but Jesus will never fail. Jesus will never fail. So he wants us to understand that false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders. Let's read a little how the book of Revelation confirms this prediction. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 13 and 14, it says, And he doeth great wonders. So that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword. And did live. I promised pastor that I wasn't going to do any prophecy. But this is a bit of prophecy. You can scan Daniel, the book of Daniel, and you can see vividly before John the Revelator was given this vision. Daniel was caught up in vision and he saw the exact same thing. In the last day. These are the last days. Everybody feels a little comfortable because Kim in North Korea said, I'm done with the nuclear weapon. Let me tell you something. The only person's word that you can trust is the word of God. Man will say anything to get what they want. Oh, friends, you must understand uh, that beast. When he shows his ugly face, I said it yesterday, it's not going to be an ugly a face that we believe is ugly. It's going to be ugly in terms of character. How they live and what they do and how they try to draw us to their side. Revelation depicts the end times. It says that one thing is for certain. That false Christ, they will not come with a sign around their neck saying, we are false Christ and false prophets. St. Vincent, I can only really emphasize where I minister. I'd love to talk more about London, but I don't have much experience here. A member came to me and was relating an incident 
at the funeral. A gentleman who calls himself a prophet. He was conducting a funeral. The casket lay in front of everyone. He's preaching. And it's time for the, the, the folk who are in charge of taking out the body from the funeral home to do what they have to do. And he decides to come and stand in front of the casket. Called them and he told them to open it up. And he started to say, get up! Get up! Get up! The dead person moved not. The Bible says, by their signs, by their fruit, sorry, you will know them. People still flock to his church. That is a sign that he is not connected to the divine. That's a sign that he has a, a, some sort of a different thinking. I understand that God uh, can resurrect the dead if he chooses. Uh, but it is not up to us to decide uh, when God will act and when he won't act. Uh, it's not up to us to decide uh, how we're going to follow him or how we're not going to follow him. Uh, uh, the Bible declares uh, that we are to serve him. Uh, in truth, uh, the Bible declares uh, that we are to serve him uh, according to his word. So they won't come put signs around their necks. This is all part of Satan's plan. Hear what it says in uh, chapter 16. For they are spirits of devils working what? Which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle. Of that great day of God Almighty. They will simply lead those who want to not turn to the Bible, but turn to other men. They will get folk to come, and it might have been an interesting thing if when that guy had said, get up. The person had got up. I wonder what the story would have been then. But as we chuckle, the reality is that the devil can do miracles in order to deceive us. And that's why I'm not excited about these churches that only have people uh, jumping and dancing and want to back flick and doing all sorts of things. Uh, oh, friends, uh, when we come to God, uh, if you read the Bible, the Bible depicts uh, what worship is like in heaven. And we understand that as uh, Moses was given the template, uh, he or we, rather, it should mimic that which is practiced in heaven. False religions have increased phenomenally in our generation. The amount of people who claim to serve the true God. Within Christianity, you have numerous. Almost every day, somebody believes they're filled with the Spirit, so they want to start a church. But I don't believe they're filled with a spirit or in fact the spirit that they're filled with is the spirit of mammon, the love for money. Because they understand that people long for a savior. They understand that people long to get out of sin. They understand that people just want the comfort to know what will happen. Brothers and sisters, with these signs established, a question I want to ask what must we do in order to face our judgment with confidence? We know in the last days it shall be perilous times. We know in the last days men will be lovers of themselves. We know in the last days all sorts of things will happen. But one thing is for sure. We need to make sure that our confidence in God is based 
on biblical reasons and not on false hope. And that's why I believe meetings like these, uh, the core of Adventism, uh, it speaks to us because it helps us to, to recenter, to refocus, to understand from whence we came and where we're going. Paul showed that at least 60% of the world believe in hell. But only 4% think that there's a good chance that they will go there. Brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 9, 27 again. And it is appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment. No one can say when they will die. As healthy as I look, you don't know what's going on in the inside. As healthy as I look, I can leave this building and you never see or hear from me again. But yet still, uh, uh, sometimes we like to wait and say that we're going to fix things and we're going to make things right. And sadly, this is the sad part. We would believe it is only people who don't believe in God or who have backslidden are in this quandary. But a lot of people who come into the church every time the doors are open. They're not sure if they die, if they will go to heaven. I don't, wanna, I, I don't want you to answer this question, but I'm going to ask it. Don't answer it. If Jesus comes now, or if you die right now, what are your chances of going to heaven? If you have to think twice about how you're going to answer that, it means that you need to refocus it means that you need to talk to God and help him. I want you to understand that God is not man. He is our creator. And he calls us, he says, come now, let us reason together. He says he understands that our sins are dirty, but he's willing to clean it up. But he wishes only that we go to him. We can live how we want to. But God will do the judging. He will bring before us every deed, good or bad, every opportunity to give our lives fully to him in repentance. The Bible tells me that we will stand in revelation. It paints a clear picture before a great judge. Here's how uh, it is put in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. It says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive things done in his body. Some folk believe that the little things they take for granted. And understand this, there is no little sin and big sin. Somehow we believe there's a little sin and a big sin. So, because I don't break the Sabbath, I can break some other commandment. But once you break one, you are guilty of breaking. And I want you to understand this too. That not because you are keeping every single commandment means you are saved. You could be keeping every single commandment, but you still have a nasty attitude. You could be keeping every single commandment, but you don't love your neighbor as you ought to love your neighbor. God calls us to understand that there must be good balance. We must love the Lord our God with all our hearts and all our minds and our soul. And then we must love our neighbors as ourselves. We must care for each other. In order for the church to grow, it must, we must care for each other. The church must be an environment where people, uh, when they don't see someone, they should call and encourage them to continue keeping on. Have you wondered how the church, the Seventh-day Adventist church came about? In 1860, uh, when they were considering that they need to form themselves in an organization, they were scared to do it. 
Why were they scared to do it should be the question you ask him. They were scared to do it because they remembered what had happened to them when they were preparing for the 1844 movement. They thought Jesus was coming. Some of them were Catholics. Some of them were Methodists. The others were Protestants and Baptists, etc. Uh, instead of showing leniency and mercy and uh, trying to reach them to do Bible study with them, uh, these churches uh, abruptly kicked them out. Uh, and instead of caring for them, they showed no love. So when the church started, it started on the principle of love. We spoke about love yesterday. And brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that if this church is still in the next 10 years or so decide this is too small for us, let's go up another floor. It means that we are bursting at our seams. People are pouring in. People come where there is love. You know the old adage, if you want to catch flies, you don't use vinegar. You use honey, something sweet. It'll attract them and that's when they get trapped. You can't want the church to increase in numbers and you're using vinegar. You got to use honey. So God calls us to stand, understand that he is a God, and he calls us to be obedient to his word. He calls us to follow him and trust his commandment. And some of us must understand that uh, when it comes to uh, these great signs of the end times, uh, we must know that one of the signs is getting into judgment. And God's judgment is not like with uh, a man's judgment. We might say that justice is blind, but God's judgment has its eyes wide open, recording everything we do, not just so that he can put it before us, but so he gives us an opportunity to live for him. As I said earlier, Daniel too had a vision. Here's how the, the last days were shown to Daniel. He said, and I beheld till the thrones were cast down. And the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow. And the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame. And his wheels as a burning fire. Daniel calls us to understand that this is the mighty judge. This is the God that we should love. A fiery stream issued and came forth. And from before him, thousands, ten thousands ministered unto him. How do you think they ministered unto him? Did you think... They had a nice rock band kind of playing and fancy lights flashing around. Did you think you had them running up and down? Did you think you had them speaking in various tongues? No. Spirit of prophecy declares as she recorded the events that she was showing. All they were doing is crying out, wordy, wordy. Wordy is the land. Simply crying out to God and giving him his majestic praise. Oh, brothers and sisters, uh, when we look towards the signs uh, of the times, uh, we must understand that Jesus is coming soon and he's coming for a prepared people. The Bible continues to tell us in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 36. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of. Did I say that? I believe some of us don't remember that. So we believe it's okay, especially on Sabbaths. That's the time we get to meet each other. And we sit sometimes in our little clique and we have barbecue pasta and roast elder. 
and a little soup of the deacons. And our neighbors, we, we sometimes just use them for dessert. We talk things and we, we, we say things that we ought not to say and we become involved in things that are not Christian. The thoughts and deeds must be given an account of. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 14 reminds us, it says, For God shall bring every work into judgment. With every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. When the last Days are here in its full effect. In order for us to stand with confidence before God, we have to keep the word of God as he declares it. We must be a people who are a people of the word. Understand some of you are from the Caribbean. Some of you probably, you grew up here. From those from the Caribbean, can you remember when it was said as you go through the streets that Seventh-day Adventists were people of the book or people of the word? You know what that meant? That meant simply that you can stop any Seventh-day Adventist and you can ask them about any particular scripture and they had a good response for you. And if they didn't know, they would promise you to visit you later because they would go home, uh, read for themselves. And if they were not clear, uh, they would ask uh, uh, someone who would help them uh, to have a better understanding uh, so that when they visit that person, uh, they can stand before them and say, Thus uh, said the Lord. But what has happened to our church today? Why can't we open our Bibles and give a good Bible study about the life of Christ? Why can't we just invite people to understand that God loves them? Why? Every work will come into judgment. When last have you invited someone to learn more about Jesus? And the funny thing is, you don't have to invite them to an evangelistic campaign or church. You can simply invite them to your home. But these things don't happen if they are not practiced. If we've forgotten about uh, uh, devotions in the morning, if we've forgotten about uh, welcoming Sabbath, if we've forgotten about uh, closing Sabbath, and if we've forgotten about these uh, foundational things on which uh, this church was built, uh, on which uh, the Bible guides, uh, where are we going? The term or the message the word by their fruits, you shall know them. It doesn't just speak to those false prophets and preachers and teachers. It speaks to us too. By our fruits, people will know if we are truly Christians. By our fruits, they will know if we really have love. Or if we just proclaim it. And so, brothers and sisters, as an eternal principle... You don't ever go to a church to find the truth. I want you to understand that and get it clear. You go to the Bible to find. Because uh, when you find the truth, uh, uh, then uh, you can look for a church uh, that teaches the truth uh, and enjoy life right there. And uh, that's how I try to guide my brothers and sisters on the outside who may not know truth. I don't ever tell them, come to my church. I take them to the Bible. I show them from God's word so that they can understand. And as they understand, I say to them, now look, you know truth. Now go look for a church that teaches truth. Well, I know that they have no choice but to come to the Seventh-day Adventist church. 
It is clear, brothers and sisters, whether we believe it or not, the Bible declares, and we must understand this because some of us believe that they will be VIP in heaven. There will be a VIP section because I can wear the latest treads. I can wear designer clothes. Some of us believe because we live in a certain community. When Jesus comes, I will go first. The Bible says, for all have sinned, not some. For all have sinned and come short of the glory. God wants us to understand that all of us are in the same mess, but Jesus died to clean us up. His blood covers us and gives us the assurance of an eternal life once we trust in him. So he tells us in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So there is help for this sin-sick world as they uh, think about what the end times will really be like. There is help for us, for us to understand that we can live in such a way that when Jesus comes, he will find us indeed a prepared people. God wants to help any and everyone who would come to him for help. He calls us and he says to us, won't you go to my word daily? We must not allow the busyness of life to distract us. Why must a man or a woman gain the entire world? And in the end, their soul is lost. I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. I'd rather have him than have riches untold. Somebody needs to understand that the 24 hours that we are blessed with, we must find time to worship God. We must find time to study his word. This evening, somebody needs Jesus. And thank God he is here to say, that he loves you. Thank God that he's here to say that help is on the way. So Hebrews 7 and 25 says, Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. He simply says that yes, you can see the signs of the times. Yes, you can see what is happening in the world? But you can come to me for protection. You can come to me for guidance. Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. I don't know what I'll be or where I would be without God. Without Jesus and what he has done for me. I don't know where I would have been. I could have been a murderer. A thief. Uh, I could have been dead, but I thank God that he uses me to do his will. And I know that he wants to use everyone to, you, to do his will. If we trust Jesus, we will have the best representative the universe can provide. So he says to us, or rather he reminds us in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14, he says, uh, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. As we bring this message to a close, I want you to understand that there's nothing that any of us can ever go through that Jesus does not understand. So you know that hymn that says, does Jesus care? It's such a touching hymn when you understand the words. It says, oh yes, he cares. He's touched by my hurts and by my grief. The revelation, again, says to us, and I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. 
and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come. In the end times, God's judgment is coming home. Once you understand how this goes, it's simply like this. Everyone that lives, we will go before God. We must answer for everything that we would have done. I might have done some mighty wrong things in the past. But I thank God and I'm cleaning up that mess by looking towards him. Oh, friends, we must understand that God calls us and he says that we should come to him so that he can make us over. He says to us, and uh, as we continue, and worship him that made heaven and earth. And the sea and the fountains of water. We must understand that this earth was established because God loves us. The Bible guides us. It says, when God finally says, enough is enough. When judgment is over, somebody needs to know that they still have time before the judgment is over. It can happen Friends, in one of two ways. It can happen when you die, or it can happen when Jesus comes. <clears throat> but it makes no sense to wait for Jesus to come, or to wait to die, to come to the conclusion, I should have known better. Tonight, it's given to us another opportunity. Like the disciples, we might have asked them, what shall be the signs of your coming? When will you come? He says to us, can't you see on the telly? Can't you see in the newspapers? The signs are right before you. Don't be deceived by the things of this world. This evening, again, we want to say, God, thank you for showing me that time is almost up. If you want to say, God, thank you for showing me that time is almost up, just give him a wave. This evening, a little further than that, if you want to say, God, this is serious business. And I recognize that my life, my soul, my eternity is at stake. If you want to say, God, I want a part of eternity. If you want to say, I want a part of eternity, wouldn't you stand in agreement? Since you've stood in agreement, let me say a word of prayer for you. Would you bow your heads even as we pray? Loving Lord, signs of the times, the end time message, O oh God, you've revealed to us over and over again. We can see exactly what is happening. And so we invite you into our lives. So that you, O oh God, can first cleanse us from all sin and unrighteousness. Help us to remember, O oh God, that although you would have moved us out of sin in a certain condition, you're, you don't expect us to stay in that condition. You expect us to make changes in order to look like you. We pray, O oh God, that tonight you can anoint every person in this auditorium. We pray, O oh God, that you can fill them with a double portion of your Holy Spirit so that they can live for you daily, but more so, so that when others look upon them, that they can see a really different person, a changed individual. They can see you shining from them, O oh God. And when it is said, by their fruits you shall know them. O oh God, the fruits that would be born in the life of your children, O oh God, it will be fruits of righteousness. So we thank you, O oh God, for blessing them. And we pray that you keep them and you grant unto them the understanding that they need to live in these trying times. 
for those who could not make it, O oh God. I pray that your Holy Spirit might envelope them and help them to understand that this is seriousness. This is no joke and help them, O oh God, to come even closer to you. I thank you for this opportunity, O oh God, and I pray that you continue to bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.